Let's all pray. Lord Jesus, we come once more in this evening to your tabernacle, to your temple, Lord, and we come to worship you like the song said, Lord. We come to worship you from the bottom of our hearts, Lord. Where, where shall we go if only you have the words of life? Come and be in our midst. We get all, we got all together and we brought you with the little portion that you put in our hearts. And we come and praise you and give you thanks for all that you have done in our lives. So much things that you have done that we're, if we want to mention everything that you have done for us, Lord, we don't, we, we didn't have the time, but we invite you to come in our midst in this evening, be with everyone in this evening. We worship you and we praise you and give you, we give you the honor and the glory. In the name of our Lord Jesus, we praise you and we thank you for everything. Amen. Bless you. I want to welcome everyone in the house of God. May have your seats. Amen. Amen. Let's sing. He brought me out of the Mary clay. Amen. My heart was a stress. This Jehovah dread from Oh, I love in the pits where my sins write me down. Will I cry to the Lord from the deep Mary clay? a song. 
just gather and praise his name and yes. amen, to know that he's in the midst of his people. Amen. Amen. But Matthew is going to come and make some announcements and, and pray over the request. Amen. Amen. If they can just uh, lightly play something, we do have some prayer requests and uh, some things to bring before the church and also the brothers that are prepared to take up the tithes and offerings. You can go ahead and be prepared to do that. Um, Sister Raquel writes, um, God bless you. I wanted to thank the Lord for Sister Renee is finished with the radiation treatment and she is healed. Just had to be tested for a few months, trusting and knowing that the Lord has everything in control. Amen. We thank God for that. And also, uh, she writes to remember uh, Brother Jose and Brother Cosman as they'll be traveling to Mexico this weekend. Um, we also just want to... Uh, Remember uh, Brother Donnie Reagan and the, and the family there at the passing of his daughter, Sister Erica uh, Parker, which uh, Brother Lance was also a friend of mine that was his wife that passed. And it was just uh, her passing happened to be on her uh, youngest set of twins' birthday. So uh, remember them in prayer. Um, certainly they're, they're grieving. Heaven's gain is certainly precious and we mourn on this side so just remember uh, Brother Donnie Reagan and the, the Parker family at this time as many are, are traveling that way the funeral will be this Sunday so we just want to bring that before you um, also if you have an unspoken prayer request you just want to maybe lift your hand up that the Lord sees that Lord Jesus we know that you're mindful of all things Lord I think of the words that Job said though, though you Slay me, yet I'll trust you, Lord. You, you have everything in your control, Lord. And so we know that the sh sunshine or the cloudy skies aren't any signs of your love for us or against us. We know that you loved us because you said you love us, Lord. And therefore, Lord, we want to show our love back to you by conducting ourselves with joy in the middle of the trial. And so, Lord, we just lift our friends and family up to you during this time of grieving, Lord. And children have, have lost a, a mother and a husband has lost a wife and a father has lost a daughter and friends have lost a friend. Lord, what a, a, a trying time. But, Lord, you've brought one home. And so we know that heaven rejoices for she's finished her course. She's run her race. And now she's stepped across the porters of time, Lord. Now may we do our part, Father, to give you joy in the midst of the trial, knowing that you hold it all in your hands. Lord, you see the unspoken prayer request by the uplifted hand, Lord. We pray that you'd be their portion. Lord, we also pray for Brother Jose and Brother Cosman, as they would go to Mexico, that you'd be their portion. May your work be done. We just love you, Lord. We ask a blessing upon the tithes and offerings. In your name, the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. We just wanted to um, make an announcement concerning the weekend um, before we get too far. Just remember, there is a brother's breakfast um, this Saturday in between 9 and 11, and we'll be covering the sermon, Go Wake Jesus, 63, uh, and November 3rd. 
Uh, so that'll be Saturday in between 9 and 11. Uh, we, we're excited to have Brother Bryce Collins coming um, this weekend and to bring the word. We're, we have a little, um, just an outreach service we're doing at um, 6 p.m. on Saturday. Uh, how many here have invited uh, somebody to that service? All right. I pray we can do better than that. That's the purpose of the service. Amen? It's an outreach service. Hey, y'all, that, those neighbors you haven't told about the message and those coworkers and those people you play ball with, invite them to church. This is, what this, this is an opportunity to help facilitate a tool that you can say, you know what, it's on a Saturday. They don't uh, likely have service Saturday night. And it might, maybe go out of your way. Try to ask your neighbor, ask somebody you come in contact with. That, that's, that's the purpose of this outreach service is for you to, to have an opportunity to invite somebody to come. So we just don't want this to be some, uh, you know, just another something that you feel you're obligated to come to. Let's have an expectation. And maybe it's a family member, a loved one, a neighbor, a friend at school. Just may, maybe pray about it and reach out to them. And we, we have a little flyer that you can that you can give to them and invite them, and then we'll just um, uh, have some refreshments to follow just to have a little fellowship. So I'm, I'm anxious to see what God has in store. I, I have uh, um, no idea how the service is going to go or what, how the Lord is dealing with the man of God's heart, but I'm in great expectation for souls to be saved, for uh, people to be born again, and I'm just in great expectation for that. So will you do that? Will you join together in prayer? Will you invite somebody? How many will make an effort to invite somebody? How many will make an effort to invite somebody? Praise the Lord. Let's do that. And then also we do have something um, Saturday as well for the youth. We'll be meeting at the boys' ranch in between 11 and 3. So we have that little uh, uh, youth announcements. If you're going to make it, uh, please uh, give a thumbs up. That lets us know you're coming. And if there's more than one of you, give another thumbs up for the number of people that are coming. And that also, I want that to be also an opportunity. Feel free to invite a friend or somebody um, that you, a coworker or somebody you go to school with and you just want to get them around the believers. Um, when you shine your light, it makes a great difference. Uh, it, it's just not in these four walls, but it's your life that's lived. Get somebody around other believers and when they see the hope that is within you and they see uh, the children of God coming together and, and enjoying one another's company and fellowship, you never know how big of an impact that'll make to somebody. So we just encourage you to uh, invite somebody for the youth to invite a friend to that afternoon luncheon where we have a little volleyball and some things set up and some food. And then remember also that uh, Sunday morning will be our only service at 10 a.m. And then there will, will be no evening service. So just keep that in prayer. Keep Brother Bryce Collins in prayer. And we're just looking forward to what the Lord has in store. God bless you. Amen. KFG. Oh, the splendor of the King Oh, I clothe in majesty Oh, I let all the earth rejoice All the earth rejoice Oh, and he wraps himself Oh, 
David said I didn't need an introduction. But for those of you that I don't know, my name is George Smith. I come from Tennessee. You may be seated. It's a privilege to be with you again. I was here last year, and I've been many places. We're not going to go through the travel log. But um, I was in Australia a couple weeks ago, and um, glad to be here tonight. And we trust that everybody can understand either English or the <laughs> translation. And um, I would like to um, say that a long time ago, in 1964, Brother Branham said that <clears throat> if things go on the way they are right now, now whatever he was focusing, I don't know, but the confusion there was back then, he said if things go on the way they are right now, in 50 years it'll be total idolatry, total insanity. Now, some of you didn't live that long, but I have. And from 2014 till now, it's been total insanity. Everything is upside down. It's not going back to normal. No. I didn't bring the level, but you can imagine. You see the cross down here? See the cross up there? Well, it's level. Okay. And the, the way to keep things level is the long part of the cross is your prayer life. If you put forth the effort and speak to the Creator, He will help the other part to stay level. So <clears throat> with this total insanity that we've got going on, uh, it breeds confusion. Now all of us, you know, we live in this 21st century, and we see the confusion, we try to make sense out of it. It's impossible. It's confusion. So when you see a confusing issue, you go the other way. Because you cannot fix it. You're not smart enough. You're not a prophet. You cannot fix it. So stay off the internet and don't think that you're going to help those people. They're going to the hot place and they're not coming back. So get yourself ready for the rapture. That's simple. And God is not the author of confusion. That's the other power. There's only two things. There's God and there's Satan. And you have a choice to make. You see, that's why you come to church. And um, so we're all about balance. Yes, things have to be balanced. These nice cars we'll get out here, <laughs> if one tire is not balanced, you get a lousy ride. If one valve isn't right, all of it's got to be balanced. And so we've got four steps to, to uh, achieve balance. And you've probably heard them before, but you're going to hear it again. Because if I only come once a year, then you probably forgot. You have your Bible. Okay, this is God in printed form. You never put anything on top of your Bible. No, no. prophet said that. So you read at least one chapter out of your Bible every day, starting tonight. One chapter. You read one page out of your church age book. Now I don't want to hear no excuses. We got some extra we can sell you. And you listen to a minimum of 20 minutes of the prophet preaching. And I don't want to hear no excuses. You got lousy traffic here. You're stuck. Don't start screaming at the other drivers. Because you're all in the same line. <laughs> Listen to the prophet. Or you can also pray. So those are the four steps. You read your Bible, you read church age book, you listen to the prophet, and you pray. Now you do that every day. Because, see, you've got 16 hours in the day free. You're supposed to sleep eight hours. So those 16 hours, you can carve out a little piece to um, do these things. And you will have a more balanced life. God will bless you. God will bless the church. And you'll have a better attitude. Okay. Now, <clears throat> we're all aware of a lot of things going on in Israel. This is God's program. You don't have to take sides. You don't have to act ugly or feel bad at anybody. Just watch it happen. It's going to be very interesting. It's going to be very long. It's going to be very hot. We had a trip planned for uh, December, but we canceled it because you can't take people into a war zone. And so we know people over there. We've talked to them. They're fine right now. But um, we just hope that our leader that's over there now doesn't say too much because every time we try to tell Israel how to run their business, we have a natural disaster. 
because God's watching. And so um, he will take care of them. There's going to be people die, but this is war. It's going to happen. Okay, the other announcement that I must bring to your attention, uh, my brother-in-law, Billy Paul, has been very, very sick for many months. He's been suffering with pancreatic cancer. Now, his desire was that nobody know and just kind of slip away. Well, it's not going to happen. You know, it's Billy Paul. So <clears throat> he's now in the final stages. He's in hospice. His wife has turned him loose. Lord, thy will be done. So there's a lot of stuff on the Internet, but the truth is he's still alive. But he won't last long. So pray for his wife, Lois. Pray for the family. Uh, we don't know the mind of God. We can only take one step at a time, headed to the resurrection, and stay balanced. You can't, I can't emphasize how important that is. So tonight we're going to open our Bibles into the book of Acts. And I know some of you, oh, we're going to study Acts. Yeah, we're going to study it again. I ran into a real good preacher the other day. He said, I've never, I've never studied the book of Acts. You, you can stay seated. We're going to go through it slowly. Yeah, stay seated. We're not going to read the whole chapter. But we're going to start with Acts chapter 10. And um, uh, this is the foundation. This is, this is where it all started. This is our, our church, you know. And in chapter 9, we have where that Peter had been um, over there and raised the, the dead. Her name was Tabitha, also Dorcas, same name. And then it says that he stayed a few days with a man called Simon the Tanner. This man tanned hides. They used to do it right here in Fort Worth many years ago. Maybe they still do. Tan hides, they use them. That was his job. And so while he's resting a few days, meanwhile, 40 miles north in Caesarea, uh, up the coast, there was a Gentile man, a believer, a man called Cornelius. Now, Cornelius was in charge of the Italian regiment. Could, could have been as many as 600 soldiers. He was an important man. And uh, he had a vision from the Lord about 3 p.m., and his name was called from the other dimension. Now, if, that, if that's never happened to you, well, it might happen today or tomorrow. But if your name is called from the other dimension, you tend to pay attention. It's happened to me. So chapter 10 and verse 3, it says here, he saw a vision evidently about the ninth hour, which is 3 p.m. And uh, an angel of God coming into him, saying unto him, Cornelius, there's his name called. Okay, so it's pretty uh, important. And he looked on him, he was afraid, and he said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thy alms are come up before a memorial before God. And now you need to send three men. Yeah, I'll say it a little later. You need to send these men to Joppa, which is down south, and call for one. His name is Simon. His last name is Peter. And he gives him the address. He's with Simon the Tanner. His house is by the sea. Why, would he, why do you need him? He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. He had to have a preacher to expound to him the word of the Lord. Okay? So now we know what side I'm on. Good. So verse 7, he sends three trusted men down to Joppa, just as the angel told him. They took off, they traveled through the night, and they arrived about noon the next day. Okay? Now, where's Peter? He's up on top of the flat-roofed house. Because it's cooler up there, there's a breeze, and he's up there meditating, and um, uh, it was quiet. And so downstairs, they're fixing lunch. So in verse 10, you know, he's getting hungry while they're preparing lunch. He's taken into a vision, a supernatural experience, because a seer, a prophet, lives in two dimensions. Okay? Now, these things are important, and they're in the message, they're in the scripture, we're not making anything up. So... A seer and a prophet, same thing. They live in this dimension, and they live in the other dimension, but they're right here. See, if Brother Brandon was here, he could truthfully say that he sees 500 people here. When there's only 161, maybe, whatever. So they, they see more people. They see angels and so forth. And so he's in this, uh, having this experience, and uh, it's very natural for a prophet to uh, enter into this other dimension, and uh, it's like when there's, a, when there's a construction zone, you know, they put up a plastic fence or something and to keep the nosy people out. But a prophet can look over the fence and he sees what's going on. 
Now, the challenge is, how much of this do I tell them, and what words do I use? That's his challenge. And so it's his vision is for him, and he will decide how and when he interprets it to the people, you see. So verse 11 and 12 gives us the, the, the vision that he saw. Just imagine a king-sized sheet tied at the four corners. It's coming down. It's got all these animals in it, okay, all kinds of animals. And um, the fact is that God gave the Jewish people very strict dietary laws. That's too bad he didn't give it to the, to the Gentiles because we might you know, have to be a little healthier. But he gave these dietary laws to the Jews, and um, it was things they could eat, things they should not eat. And here's God showing in a symbol with all these mixed animals. He's showing something to his um, uh, prophet, the man with the keys of the kingdom, and only he knew the interpretation. If it was left up to us, we'd have a hundred different interpretations. But the interpretation was that the gospel is for everyone. You know, no more of this separating things. And um, it's not just for the Jewish people because, see, the, the early church was mostly Jewish people. Jesus told them, only go to the house of Israel. Only, only to our people. And now here, the things are changing. Okay? And so... Um, these laws were so ingrained in the people from, from a child on up. You, you do this, you don't do that. that. That's just the way they live. It's a way of life. There's still people today. They have certain pots they can cook this in and other pots for this. They have like two kitchens almost. And so uh, when we're over there, you don't have the, the product of the animal and the animal itself. In other words, if you're going to have brisket, there's no butter for the corn. There's no milk for the coffee. You can't have the two together. It's just one of their laws. And so this is so ingrained in them that Peter, what's he do? You know, he, he was converted. He had, he had the keys and he was full of the Holy Ghost. He still had that mouth problem. I'm sure nobody here has that same problem, but, you know, he had it. So in verse 13, the angel says to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And he says, no, 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 I have never done such a thing. No, there's the common and the unclean and so forth. And the voice spake to him a second time. Get a second chance, Peter. What God has cleansed, don't you dare call it common. God is in control, not you. And this was done three times. Okay? So the voice speaks to him. You know, Peter, pay attention. This is not a debate. This is serious. Three times, and then... The vision opened and closed and disappeared, and Peter got the message. Okay. So he's still arranging these new ideas. It's this new order in his mind. And these visitors show up at the gate downstairs. They're knocking on the gate. So then the Lord speaks to him and says, Now look, you need to get yourself together, get your hat on or whatever, and go down because I sent three men to look for you, and, and they're looking for you. So get down there. Okay. So he goes down, he opens the gate. I. I'm the one you're looking for. How can I help you? It's right there in your Bible. And so they explained how God had spoke to their commander, and he was warned of God. So he invited them in, and um, they, uh, they came in. They spent the night. The next day, they started walking 40 miles. Probably nobody here walked 40 miles, but you know, some people do. Some people run. Well, I don't run. You know, Me and David, we like the leather chair. And so... <laughs> So they start walking, and uh, they, um, they, got to, uh, they got to Caesarea the next day, and Cornelius was there waiting for him. Yeah. And he called all his relatives in, his close friends, and he believed the vision. You know, send for this guy. He's going to tell you what you need to do. So he calls all his friends in, his relatives. And when Peter came through the door, this fearless commander of, you know, all these soldiers, he goes down on his knees. Wow, this is really happening. Yeah. And uh, he falls down on his knees to worship this man of God, the very person that the angel told him about. You probably would, too. I mean, a vision, it's coming to pass. Well, but see, the thing is, genuine servants of God do not accept any kind of worship. A birthday card is one thing. But we don't worship, you know. And so um, of any kind. So here's the man of God, the spokesman for the Lord, the man with the keys. He had been used of God for many miracles. That's true. Even raising uh, Tabitha a few days before. And um, even though Peter had made some mistakes, argued with Jesus, argued with the angel, he was learning balance. Okay? 
That's what he was learning. It was hard, but he was learning and he was teaching others. This is the early church. They had no New Testament. Their Bible was the Old Testament, and at that time it was a 200-year-old translation, and that's what they quoted. And so the early church, Peter, Paul, the rest of them, they had a similar ministry such as William Branham in the sense that they came and they said, look, all this that you guys memorized back here, it's coming to pass. This day, these scriptures are being fulfilled. Now, it was hard to turn the corner. They've been used to this. They've been used to, you know, the same, same, same. But it's time to turn the corner. And so that's where we're at tonight. We're turning the corner. We're headed towards the rapture. You have an opportunity to get ready. The ones that decide to stay home and watch TV, they lost out. But you're here. So may God bless you. So when he got inside, there's all these people. And the first thing he said was over here in verse 28. He said, um, you know that it's unlawful for me being a Jew to keep company with you of another nation. That was the, the, they had strict segregation. The Americans, you know, we've decided in this day and age, yeah, we're going to just have a segre- you know, integration. Well, it's not worked out all that great, especially in the world. And the believers, it's different. But over there, they had this strict segregation. And uh, you, you couldn't even, no, those, those are heathen. We're the people of God. Okay, and um, so from the vision before, you know, he'd already had the the interpretation. You know, it's illegal for me to be here. We have segregation, but God has showed me a better way. So he was expanding his comfort zone, you see. And you see, God gives the vision or the experience to the prophet, and only the prophet can also provide the interpretation. Now, I've been in this over 50 years, and I know a lot of people that have spent their life They've wasted their life. They've wore out the pencil sharpener. They've wasted their children figuring out prophet's vision. Forget it. It's the prophet's vision. God will give us what we need at the hour that we need it. Not a minute before, you see. So there's the sheet full of animals. And God has shown me a better way. Nobody would ever figure it out. It's his vision, you see. So the prophet is the anointed vessel. We're simply the repeaters. You know, declaring the manifestation of the prophet's prophecy. Brother Branham said, it's coming to pass. You see, so the same thing with Israel today. All that's been prophesied. God is in charge. He doesn't need our opinions. The sign says, be still. I'm God. I got to figure it out. Don't need your opinions. Okay. So um, he doesn't require, require our opinions. We can only be yielded, flexible, available, And through human beings, he will accomplish his perfect will and manifest himself to a dying generation. We don't have to wear a sign. No, just be a Christian. Billy Graham said, when the gospel of Jesus Christ is presented with authority, quoting from the very word of God, he then takes that message and drives it supernaturally into the human heart. See, that's where the the pastor gets a lot of his headaches. He studies, he sacrifices, he preaches, and people still dress the same. They still do the same. Because they don't come to church correctly. You come in here yielded. Yes, Lord, whatever you have to say, I'm ready. But we come in here with ideas, you know, oh, it's got to be this way. No, God will drive it into the heart. We can only speak it, you see. Okay, so once he cleared the air, you know, Jews meeting Gentiles, verse 29, why did you send for me? Ha, huh, great question. Verse 30, and Cornelius said, now four days ago, you know, I had this vision and so forth. He relates the whole deal. And uh, so they were totally ready for whatever he had to say. They were prepared. Whatever. They'd never heard of this. This is a new message. But an angel appeared, you know. And um, so he, uh, he says, we're ready. No prejudice, no preconceived ideas. Whatever God has, we want it. So Peter preaches to a humble home meeting to Gentiles for the first time. Up to then, only Jews. Okay? So in 10 verses, he gives the entire gospel message, simple to the point. Look at verse 40, for example. So he's talking about Jesus Christ all through here. <coughs> Excuse me. And God, him God raised up from the, on the third day and showed him openly. Now see, nobody had ever heard of a resurrection before. This, this is the first they're hearing about it. Now, the Jews that were, you know, in the synagogue and had it all figured out, and it's got to be this and this and this, they were against this. Organized religion was against the message of the day. 
But he says, and showed him openly, not to all the people, thank you, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. Very interesting. So you see, God controls all the details. 42. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. To him give all the prophets witness. That's why Brother Branham could say all through the Old Testament is Jesus Christ. Amen. If you didn't see it, go back and read it again. So he's saying the same thing. All the prophets give witness that through his name, that's the key right there. Through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Okay, so that is a very important uh, point there, through his name. And um, hopefully we'll have a study on that later. But you see, we have people today carrying the King James Bible, carrying the tablet, carrying the, the spoken word books. They're in pulpits tonight in certain places of this country and other places Proving to the people that Jesus wasn't God. Oh, they, they got it figured out. They're taking the deity out of the name of Jesus Christ and putting it over here in this teaching and that, whatever. Doomed for failure. It's happening. Okay? But it's very important. And so, you see? And um, manifested in speaking different tongues, magnified God. Even before they were baptized, all oh, the legalists had a problem because you're supposed to believe and they're baptized and then the Holy Ghost. God can do anything. Amen. You know, when I, when I listen to the news, I'm surprised that the sun comes up the next day because this whole thing could blow up in the next 30 minutes. It's that close. So God can do anything, you see. And uh, verse 47 is where that, um, uh, let's see here. Peter says, now can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? So he's remembering just a few days, you know, who knows how, you know, we don't know the time frame, but it's, it's shortly after the day of Pentecost. And yeah, that, that happened to us. Here it is again. Now, can anyone you know, forbid baptism? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord, then prayed them to, they could stay there a few days. Okay, so as you read through the book of Acts, because you're going to do it, right? Right? Yeah. So you're going to read through the book of Acts. You're not going to find any place that they repeated the red letter uh, uh, words of Jesus of Matthew 28, 19. But they took the revelation of it in the name of. See? And that's why it's always in the name of the Lord, like it says here. Okay. So uh, he, uh, he's with these people. And um, we, uh, we're going to go into chapter 11 because, you know, you've got to wait till the traffic dies down before you go home anyway. We might as well be here stuck in traffic, right? So in chapter 11, and the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. Okay, they didn't have cell phones. They didn't have telegraph. They had nothing. But somehow the news got there before Peter got there. They heard what happened at Cornelius' house. <laughs> And they should have been rejoicing to see the further fulfillment of Acts 1 and 8. You shall be my witnesses here in Jerusalem, or Judea, Samaria, and all the way to Bedford, Texas. The gospel didn't come in a parachute. Somebody came over here on a horse, brought the gospel, and we're rejoicing. You know, we've got air conditioning, we've got nice seats. And don't anybody think about going to sleep. Because I will get upset. Okay. So, um, but see, they were humans just like us. They had religious segregation. They had religious ideas, even though they knew Jesus Christ and so forth. You see, the church is like a hospital. Nobody checks your credit card at the door. Nobody says if you got the right papers. It's a hospital. Everybody's welcome. Visitors, whoever. And the gospel, the word coming from the pulpit, will make you comfortable to stay and get straightened out or chase you away. We don't do that you know, physically. So um, all are welcome. And um, so you see, John 3.16 is still part of the word of God. It's not just Billy Graham's message. Nobody is getting out of here without being born again, receiving the Holy Ghost. Otherwise, you'll stay for the tribulation. Okay, it's just that simple. 
Because it says, for God so loved the world. Now up to there, that's the Pope's favorite scripture. Oh, God so loved the world. Oh, bring them all in. Doesn't matter what they look like, what they're doing. No. No. That he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes, oh, they've got to do something, yeah, believe on him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. God loved us sinful creatures so much. It's no small thing. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, you know, the club, beat down everybody. No, but that the world through him might be saved. It's God's provided way. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Why? Because he has not believed what? That God sent a prophet? It doesn't say that. Has not believed the name of the only begotten Son of God. You must believe. You must take it serious. Okay. So, verse 2, Peter, you know, arrives back in Jerusalem to face a scorching rebuke by some of the more narrow-minded believers. I'm sure you know a couple somewhere. And since the news arrived first, they had all their arguments ready. Their favorite quotes were underlined, highlighted. Peter was simply wrong. There's just no other way about it, you know. In verse 3, you actually went into the house and you ate with those heathens? What's wrong with you, Peter? Peter had the keys. He had the Holy Ghost. Yet... They're condemning him because he wasn't following the rules that they had figured out, you see. So when Peter, you know, he told his side of the story in detail, it's verses 4 through 18. Um, you know, he tells the whole story about, you know, this man had the vision, sent men to Joppa and so forth. Now look at verse 18 of chapter 11. And when they heard these things, they held their peace. Oh, so they heard the other side of the argument. They calmed down. And glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Yeah, the door is open for the Gentiles now. Okay, so it gets a little better. So we are over here in the 21st century. We call ourselves believers because we believe all the word. We don't put any buts and, no, that's not right. No, there was an ark. There was people going through the desert. We're not doing that today because God's got his word section off into pieces. We're over here in the back of the book where we're getting ready to go. And all the signs around us are obvious, you see. And so we don't want to be like, you know, cafeteria Christians, just take the, the chocolate and just the little pieces we like. No, we believe all the word, you see. And um, uh, Brother Bram told us that the word all dovetails together. And if it doesn't, then read it again. You can't go wrong reading your Bible. This is our guidebook. You see, so the angel that appeared to Cornelius, um, he could have told him the whole story. He could have wrote it on the wall. Here, Cornelius, you do this and this and this and this. No, he said, go down there, find this man, bring him. He'll tell you what to do. Yeah, it says right here, verse 14, I believe it is. Uh, He shall tell thee the words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. So they were ready. They want to be saved. They want, they want to get with the program. And you see, God has put it in his word over here in Romans chapter, uh, where is it, chapter 10. Uh, the, the plan that, you know, the Baptists and everybody else, they got it down pat. But it's for us also. Just because we're up here in the top of the pyramid, we can't just throw part of it away. No. In, in Romans 10, verse 9, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus... And shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Simple formula. Verse 10. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, you know, in their old Bible, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. And you're probably wondering where that is. That's actually in Isaiah 28, 16. Okay. It says here, for there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. That's what they were dealing with then. So there's no difference between the American and the Mexican and the one from Congo, the one from Canada. No, it's God over a whole thing, you see. That's why it says here, for there's no difference between these. For the same Lord uh, over all is rich to all that call on his name. So for whosoever shall call upon his name, on the name of the Lord, shall be saved. Well, that sounds good so far. But how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? you gotta, you got to believe. Okay, then we got to back the truck up a little farther. How shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? So that's why these brothers going to Mexico, my country. Yeah, I was born down there. 
um, they're going to announce the gospel, you see. How shall they believe in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without, oh, there it is, preacher. In the Bible. I mean, I didn't write the Bible. But if we don't speak what it says, how do we expect any blessing? You, you can't go north and get to San Antonio. It doesn't work. <laughs> you got to go by the book. Okay. And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Okay. So these people in Caesarea were chosen of God. Uh, they were elect of God, but they needed help. And God provided the help they needed. It was his way, his timing, always, every time, on time. Now, everybody here came to the knowledge of the Lord at a different time. We all didn't come the same day. And there's things said today maybe you never heard before. You're going to go out when you hear it again. Oh, that's what Brother George said. So there's a time of accepting, you see. And God knows what you need and when you need it. That's why he calls you to church. That's why you're building this new church, which is beautiful. And it's going to be lovely. And I'll be back. But for now, here we are. We're enjoying the service. And God knows what he's doing. Now, um, because of you know, a lot of things going on today, I want to share five quotations with you. The first one is uh, The Angel of God, 1947, where Brother Bram says, Now God could have sent the angel down, just like here. He sent the angel to Cornelius. The angel could have told him the whole story. No, it doesn't work that way. He could have let the angel come himself, but instead of that, he sent an angel to speak through the voice of a man. God always used man for his work. Is that right? He doesn't use organizations, so forth, the mechanical devices. He uses men. And Sunday school teachers and people with godly lives, you know. Okay, 1950, God and his people. God does not fall on denominations. God falls not... God does not fall upon mechanical devices. The Holy Spirit fell on men. I know you get tired of it, but you remember when we were in school? Repetition. Oh, and you finally caught on. Well, that's what we're doing here. Conference, 1960. God came down and the conference was held. How the church must be run. Must it be run by a bishop, organization, some mechanical device? How must it be run? There was 120 in the upper room. That's where it started. Uh, 1962. Behold, a greater than Solomon. God doesn't take an idol. He takes a man. And if a man will prostrate himself in the presence of God, God then puts himself in that man, and the man becomes a living creature that God is living in, not a dead idol, but a man. God never used idols. He always used men. Get it in. God doesn't use machinery, mechanical devices. He uses men. Okay, so those few people out there that only want to hear what he said after 63... Uh, in God in simplicity in 63, he always works in simplicity. But God in the beginning could have made the son to preach the gospel. Because I don't know if you noticed, if you get up early enough, the son comes up right on time. Never fails. And the scientists have figured it out to such a degree that they know when there's going to be an eclipse 30 years ahead. Because it's, they can depend on it. It doesn't depend on whether you know, it feels like it or not. The sun is always there. The moon is always there. But God didn't use that, or the winds, or an angel. He ordained men for that purpose, and he never changes it. So every believer listens to God's prophet. That, that's our whole life. I've been working with Brother Ram's words for over 50 years. And just get it in, in, in Spanish to where people can understand it. Well, you know, you remember the four steps I gave you. But it doesn't require somebody from headquarters. Now, on this day, at this time, you push the button. That's organized religion. That's not the way God operates. I'm sorry. You know? So let's move on to more pleasant things here. So here's the main man, you know, the man with the keys. He's having a home meeting, just a few people, exactly like on the day of Pentecost. <laughs> and, you know, Jesus told him in, in John 14, 25, these things have I spoken to you, being present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring to your remembrance the things I told you. We need the Holy Ghost in our life. It's not optional, not if you feel like it, not if the you know, stars are just right. No, you need the Holy Ghost. 
So when the narrow-minded believers heard the whole story, they quieted down. Wow, this is for everyone, not just us. Because the master told them in Mark 8, 34, Whosoever will come after me and deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. The gospel is for whosoever will. There's no segregation with God. You know, he knows what he's doing. Okay. So God knows who the elect are. I don't know who they are. Now, I hate to tell you, but the fact is, there's three kinds of believers in every group of people. Now, I see some people going to sleep back there. Where's my... I didn't bring my level. I might throw something. <laughs> but there's three kinds of believers in every crowd. I don't know who you are. We're all fine right here. But when you go out of here and you're drinking coffee and probably eating too much pie or something, yeah, the bald-headed preacher and that bald-headed pastor, you know, all those kind of comments, they won't know who you are. Yeah. So don't worry about the person next to you. Who are you? You see? Okay. So God knows who the elect, I don't know who they are. You know, we cast the net, God puts it in the heart. Okay. So meanwhile, in verse 19, we focus on those that were scattered after the death of Stephen. And if you remember, we covered that before. But these people saw that people getting killed for following this way. So they picked up stuff and they, they went to other places to raise their family. Um, they traveled far away. They went to Lebanon. Of course, you see, their world was very small. Marco Polo hadn't been born yet. They, they didn't know it was a round ball out here and the people over there. No, they, they, their, their world was small. So they went far away to Lebanon, 120 miles north. They sailed all the way over to Cyprus, 150 miles. They went up to Turkey, which is Antioch, 300 miles. They went seeking someplace less dangerous to raise their family. And um, when they settled, they settled in a, a Jewish community, you know, and um, they started testifying. Yeah, where'd you come from? What happened to you? What's going on down there? So they started testifying, and um, uh, they stayed with their own kind. But you see, from chapter 2, we learned that Jews were everywhere. Because you see, on the day of Pentecost, Jesus told them, now you guys need to go up to the upper room and wait until. He didn't tell them how many days. He didn't tell them exactly what's going to happen. You'll know it when it happens. So there they are, 10 days, but they didn't know how long. So day one, two, and so forth. At the same time, there's people gathered in Jerusalem from all these countries. Because in the Old Testament, we had seven different feast occasions throughout the year. And on three of those occasions, all the male believers must come to Jerusalem and, you know, worship. Well, it just so happened that there was an overlay. While these 10 days are going on, these six days are going on, too. And so when the 10 days are up, they're all still there. And they come out and they're speaking languages that these people understand. Because in the church, their Bible is in Hebrew. So they all spoke Hebrew all, for all over the world. They still do. But they spoke the language where they come from. So they were at least bilingual. And so when these guys come out of the upper room, stumbling around in speaking this other language, somebody, there were 16 different languages they were speaking, and they heard them in their language, but with a Galilean accent. It's like when people come from Canada, you know, you, you know they didn't, weren't born here. And so they had this accent, and that was what was going on on the day of Pentecost. Okay, so um, some of them spoke Greek, they're in verse 20. Cyprus is still Cyprus. Uh, Cyrene is now Libya. And of course, these places are in, in the news all the time. And let's see what it says in verse 21 of chapter 11. Um, For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. And so God was blessing the testimonies. All you have to do is let your light shine. You don't have to put a sign out, believers live here or whatever. You know, the, the people from, from out in Salt Lake City, they got the little sign, you know, elder so-and-so. Elder, are you kidding me? They're 21 years old. And, um, yeah, you've seen them. Do you realize that those, those people that are, that are going out like that, they could say they're missionaries, they go to some foreign country for two years, their family has to put up $10,000 for that to happen in the first place. It's ridiculous. So all you got to do is let your light shine naturally. God will do the supernatural. 
because every piece of the puzzle is important. God knows where it belongs, okay? So when the apostles at Jerusalem heard about the revival in these faraway places, they sent Barnabas. Now, Barnabas is the son of encouragement, and that's what he did. He went to encourage. Um, let's see here. Where are we at? Verse 11, chapter 11, verse 23. Uh, no. But anyway, he, he went over there to encourage them, and they, um, they had great time. In the meantime, Paul went back to his place in Tarsus, and it would be this family. And then uh, uh, Barnabas went to find him, and they, um, they, uh, were, they came back to, to uh, Antioch, and they were with the believers there, had a great time. And the believers were first called... Christians at Antioch, you know, and the reason I can't find it, I'm still here in Romans. Yeah. In Acts chapter 11, 26, um, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch, and it came to pass that the whole year, for a whole year, they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch, you see. So the term church was first used over in chapter 8. Saul made havoc of the church and other places. But these were simply local gatherings of believers of like faith. They didn't have a building like this. Oh, they were in their home, under a tree, in a park, whatever. Only in the 4th century did the church mean, did the word mean a building, you see. So in forming a church, these early Christians did not drop out of society and, you know, go off and have a commune someplace. Um, they didn't form congregations that competed one another for members. It was a radical, powerful new concept driven by the power of the Holy Ghost, which dominated their lives. The Holy Ghost was obvious, you see. And so the people in the street called them Christians because they lived the life of Christ. Can they say that about you wherever you go tomorrow? Oh, there goes a Christian. Or there goes somebody that stole some money. Or that guy stole the other guy's wife. You know, no, Christians. You see, and like the Methodists, you know why they call them Methodists? Because they came along and they established a methodical way of worship. It was there was a method, so they called them Methodists. And just like here, it, at first it was a, a, a word of uh, derision, you know, oh those Christians, but it stuck because they do live the life of Christ. But I think I mentioned once before, in the Catholic Church, there's a certain saint that some of you remember. Francis of Assis. Remember that? Okay. So Francis of Assis was an uh, Italian priest. He preached the gospel. Brother Branham said so. And so one of the things he said, preach always. Use words when necessary. Yeah, like when you're driving, when you're shopping, when you're school. You got to love those that don't love you. That's when they know you're a Christian, you know. So they were called of the way, uh, in the beginning, they were mostly Jewish, but here at Antioch, it was multicultural. There was all kinds of people. So it was no longer enough to call them Jews, Greeks, or Romans. They had a central theme, Christ. And that was, at first, kind of a put-down, but um, it caught on, and the church in Antioch was growing, and from Jerusalem, there came down prophets to visit them, you know. One of them was called Agabus, and he gave warning that a famine was coming. See, a prophecy is something serious. It's not the Lord is coming. and No, it's got to be something really serious. And so it, it did come. And you can check history and read about Emperor Claudius Caesar, the fourth emperor of Rome, very bad ruler. And during his time, there was a famine. And that's when he expelled the Jews and some of the Christians from Rome. But in the first show of brotherly kindness that we have in the Bible, the church at Antioch sent missionary money to, up to Jerusalem. Okay, by the hands of Paul and uh, Barnabas to the saints in Judea that were hurting. Now, these people lived their Christianity. It wasn't just, you know, me, you know, God bless you, see you later. No, they actually shared. They actually sacrificed for each other, you know. And like Brother Bram says, eternal life is living for others so that others can see Christianity in action, you know. And it wasn't just quoting and arguing. But they really cared for one another, and the word was manifesting in their lives, and the followers, 
and Jesus Christ was alive. They could actually, you know, they didn't have their Bible to quote from, but Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. We are in the forever part now. We, we passed yesterday, passed and now it's today. So he was very alive in the first century because people believed and totally yielded to the Spirit of God. John 13, 35 says, By this shall all men know that you're my disciples. Because you go to a certain nice church up on Central Avenue. Because you all drive nice cars. No, because you have love one to the other. They notice that because they don't have that. They speak about nonsense and they have their parties and their stuff. But when they see people that actually care for each other, actually send money to the foreign field to help those people, those people really care. So, um, do we have time for a few more verses? Yeah. There's no fee in the parking, right? Yeah, if the rapture comes, good. Yeah. Okay, so chapter 12, this is interesting. Chapter 12 says, Now about that time, while all this is going on over here that we just talked about, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. That means put the pressure on them. Make their life miserable. That's what vex means. Okay? So this King Herod, there's seven different family members in the Herodian family in Scripture. It's another study. They were all anti-God, evil, backed by headquarters in Rome. This here is uh, Herod Agrippa. He was feeling all powerful, you know, his normal arrogant self, full of himself, and thought it would be pleasing to his Jewish subjects to put some pressure on the Christians. Hmm. Verse 2, and he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. Now, see, we've heard about it this week, how they beheaded people over there. Okay, it sounds terrible, but there's no suffering. Instantly, you're dead. Heads on the ground. And that's what they did back here. They've been doing it for centuries. And so, uh, this is John, uh, James, the brother of John, the two sons of Zebedee. And this is now the fifth persecution of the early church. So, from history, James, son of Zebedee, was a fisherman by trade when Jesus called him and his brother to a lifetime of ministry. Okay. As a strong leader of the church, James was ultimately beheaded at Jerusalem. The Roman officer who guarded James watched and was amazed as James defended his faith at his trial. Later, the officer, walking beside James to the place of execution, Overcome by conviction. That's Holy Ghost conviction. He saw this man, you know, defend the faith. Yes, I will not recant. I will stick with the truth. And he's, his job is to, you know, walk beside him. So they're walking to the, out there where they're going to execute him. Overcome by conviction, he declared his new faith to the judge and knelt beside James to also accept beheading as a Christian. These people were not playing church. It wasn't convenient. It was the end. Because once your head comes off, you're finished. I don't know if you've seen the film, but there is a, uh, it's on DVD and so forth, Paul, Apostle of Jesus Christ. Very, very close to scripture. It was in the theaters even. So in verse 3, when Herod saw this action, what cutting off heads was popular with the followers, it made him look good, you know. He decided to go for the main man, the one with the keys. And so he probably heard some of the testimonies, how God protected his people. And look at 12, verse 4. And when he had apprehended him, so he arrested, he sent guys out, okay, arrest that one with the keys. He put him in prison and delivered him to four quartonians of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Okay, so he's arrested Peter, got him in prison, and it's a big word there, but it means 16 soldiers. Now, these weren't soldiers like this guy on the front row. No, these soldiers probably look more like Billy. Well-fed, you know, work out every day, you know, right? (laughs) He wished he did. They were tough-looking guys. 16 soldiers to watch one preacher. See how that worked out. So here's Peter in prison, and uh, now at the meantime, while he's in prison, down in John Mark's house, they got a prayer chain going at 24 hours while they're praying, you know. And so he's in prison, and he's chained 
on either side to two of these soldiers. So there's two of them. There's 14 more guarding the, the gates. Okay. And so here's God's main man sleeping in the Roman prison, chained between two big soldiers. And um, they, um, uh, on a certain day, after the weekend, after Easter and so forth, Herod, you know, worked into his busy schedule to have Peter come up for execution, take his head off. But just hours before, during the night, Peter's sleeping there soundly. He's not squirming. And, no, he knows God's in control. And so he's sleeping soundly, chained between these soldiers. And all of a sudden, an angel appeared in a bright light. Yeah. And the angel touched him, barely touched him, woke him up. Get up quickly. Chains fell off. But the soldiers stayed asleep. Now, the chains are still on the soldiers, only they fell off of him. So he gets up. They're all still asleep. He gets up. And uh, the angel says in verse 8, get dressed, put on your sandals, put on your coat, follow me. So he's following the angel through the prison. He looks back and there's those two soldiers still asleep. They're going out and um, they go to the iron gate. It opened by itself, past the, like another gate. And they get up out to the street and they go up to the corner and the angel disappeared. Yeah. Look at verse 11 of chapter 12. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from the expectations of the people, of the Jews. Okay. So he made his way down to the house where they were praying. Remember, 24-7. Boy, they are serious. Lord, help our brother. He's over in that filthy prison. We need him. He's a servant. And they're just, man, they're praying. We don't know how many people, but there's probably a dozen or more. And so um, he's out there knocking on the gate, you know, out at the street. He's beating on the gate. They're busy praying. But there was one girl named Rhoda, and she was uh, one of those people that's always busy, you know, serving the coffee or the tea. And, and you know, somebody's got to clean up the mess. I mean, she was kind of praying silently. But anyway, she was busy. And um, so she, she hears the knocking, and she goes to respond, and she hears Peter's voice. But she goes back to tell them Peter's there. He, he's right outside. Now, honey, you're just excited. In fact, you're crazy. <laughs> she insisted, argued with him. Okay, maybe it's his angel. They were so busy praying, so concerned, but without enough faith to believe for an answer. How many times have we been there? Lord, you know I need that $1,000 and you keep, keep. Hey, okay, you said it. God heard you the first time. Now wait for the answer. So we get so caught up in the do's and the don'ts and mechanics of the word, we fail to see the, uh, the fulfillment. So we, and we get really upset when people can't see things our little, narrow, peculiar way. This is the way it's going to be. We don't step back and look at the big picture, you know. So meanwhile, Peter's out there beating on the gate. Hey, folks, you know, I'm here. And, um, and so finally they open the gate. They saw him. They're very surprised. Wow, what are you doing here? <laughs> well, you all been praying, haven't you? <laughs> oh, my. So he came in. He gave a brief testimony. Well, meanwhile, back at the prison, now the sun's coming up, you know, there's kind of some confusion, and they really got worried. Okay, 12 and verse 19. And when Herod had, uh, you know, called for him, and they found him not, he examined the keepers, so 16 guys, and commanded that they should be put to death. Well, why is that? Well, because, see, not believing in the supernatural. He didn't believe in the supernatural. And with no good explanation, the guards must have let him go. It has to be their fault. The preacher got away. And so all their heads came off. I mean, that's the way they did business back then. <clears throat> so... Verses 20 through 23, you know, Herod had a lot of difficulties with his administration. There were complaints. So he took some time off, went down to his seaside home. We can still see part of it when we go over there. And uh, he, he scheduled a, a certain day, dressed in his best outfit, and he's going to speak to his people, you know. And so he was a real spokesman. They were so proud of their leader, his tremendous abilities. And they said, it's like God speaking to us, not just a man. He was very proud and arrogant and indeed anointed with a spirit. 
But look what happened in 12 and 23. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not God the glory. And he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. Now see, we're all sitting here comfortably. The air conditioner's just right. Everybody had supper. Everybody had coffee. See, this guy, he died. And the, the worms started eating him. Amazing. So we don't play around with God. Never play around with God, you see. Um, now, there's a, a testimony, and those of you that remember, but uh, <clears throat> I think about four or five years ago, there was a, a man over in Congo, and he was, at one time, he was a good gospel preacher. But see, he got out of balance. And when you get out of balance, you're going to have problems. And he got out, so out of balance, he started teaching that William Branham was greater than Jesus Christ. He out of balance. And he started preaching that stuff. And so one day he's out there preaching it. And he takes the, the, the picture of Hoffman, rips it, and stomps on it. Yeah. And he said, and if I'm not telling the truth, may God strike me dead. And down he goes. Dead right there. So they, they picked him up and trying to get him to his village to bury, you know, bury him. And the worms were already eating him. They had to bury him on the way. Yeah, that happened in our, our time. Just like this back here. God says in Exodus 34, 14, thou shalt, for thou shalt worship no other God. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous. That's something you can take home with you. One of God's names is Jealous. He's a jealous God. Deuteronomy 4, 24. For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. Isaiah 42, 8. I am the Lord thy God. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither any praise to graven images. It's real serious. Galatians 6. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that will he also reap. For if a man soweth to his flesh, shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit, shall of the Spirit reap life, life everlasting. So as humans, we make choices every day. You're looking at one person. I'm looking at all the different colors. And, you know, you all decided what color to wear. Some wore a tie. Some didn't. Some didn't even comb their hair. So I see all that, you know. So we made choices. But you made the right choice. You came to hear another portion of the Word of God. Yeah, we need to line up, you know. So we must get in the Spirit of God, giving God all the honor. Because other people made other choices, you know. So I'm thankful that you all made a sacrifice. You said, hey, it's important. Yeah, it's real important. And so when I come back and we're in that other church, I want to see it full. Okay. So when we finish chapter 11, Saul and Barnabas, you know, taking the missionary offering to the saints in Jerusalem. And here at the end of chapter 12, they came back and they returned to Antioch. So that is our scripture lesson for tonight. We hope somebody got something out of it. But you can take something home. If it's not in your language, if it's not plain, we're wasting time. And so you, all of you have the church age book that we uh, put out with the paragraph numbers and so forth. I've done the same thing with the seal book. I have a few with me. We're going to send more, but it's in a more readable fashion. May God bless you. It makes you want to bring it to yourself individually, don't it? You know, and the, the secret is the prophet of God said that this bride should have a book of Acts written behind it. But that takes, it's not the church, like the group, because God don't deal with groups. He deals with individuals. But if every individual consecrating their life so the Holy Spirit can move and lead them and then he's the great conductor, and he takes all the little parts that he leads you, puts them all together, and then you start seeing the supernatural working amongst us without any one individual getting the credit and him getting all the glory. But it's like we're all pieces of a puzzle, and he's putting those pieces of this puzzle together and dealing with each of the heart. And if each of us would play our part, he'll draw the picture. And so we really do that. We'll get some of the uh, SEALs books uh, and get them into the library so you can be able to pick them up 
uh, through the library. You just need to talk to Juliet, and then she can work all that out with you out of the library. You love the Lord? Amen. Amen. Remember, the carnal mind is enmity with God, but the spiritual mind is life. And, and if, if you can believe, all things are possible. Let your mind embrace the supernatural. Let the Holy Spirit bring it alive in your life and make the word live. And you, for your own personal self, will be able to look at the book of Acts. For these signs shall follow them that believe. The believer doesn't create them. They simply follow a spirit-filled life full of love, full of enthusiasm, not ashamed of the gospel. Amen? Because it's the glory of God. It's the way of salvation, and we're not ashamed of it. God bless you tonight. Let's stand together and have a word of prayer. Let's just bow our heads, and maybe you just look at your life right now and ask yourself, Do I see God moving in my life? Do I see myself growing and increasing in the knowledge of Jesus Christ? Because the scripture says that you might increase in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. Do you have revelation for faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God? And ask yourself, is he alive in my life? Am I moving up? Am I growing? Am I involved? Am I hungry? Am I thirsty for the things of God? Do I want to see the angels of the Lord that are promised to be encamped about them that believe? Do I want to see them working on my behalf and come out of the carnal mindset and get into the spiritual realm where you can say in your heart, all things are possible. Nothing can pluck me out of the palm of his hand. And if he had started a good work in me, he'll finish it in the end. My sheep hear my voice and another they won't follow. And you've purposed your life to be based upon what the scripture said. Not circumstances, not fears and fiery darts of the enemy but you've rested in the eternal word of God. And that's your hope. That's your trust. That's the hope of glory. Christ in us is the hope of glory. And if the same spirit that dwelt in him dwelt in us, it too will quicken our mortal bodies. And Lord, that's what we want. We don't want to talk about it. We want to know it. We want to feel it in our lives. We want to see the love of God shed abroad. We want to see the love that comes from our heart as it strikes others. We want to see the effect of this love. We want to see the effect of our candle being lit. We want to feel, see the effect of us being salty. We don't want to leave it on the shelf. We don't want to leave it in our home. We don't want to leave it in church. But we want to go out. For no man lighteth a candle and set it under a basket or a church. But he sets it on the hill that the light might shine. That we could glorify our Father by our good work. Lord, you know, might we purpose in our hearts to get involved in Christianity. Involved in the scripture. Father, may we become one with the word. As our messenger so has guided us back to the scripture, being a divine interpreter of the word, he said, back to the word. Father, may our lives go back to the word. Father, and if those that would raise their hand and say, Lord, I want more Christianity in my life. I want more biblical reality in my life. I want a more sense of, of the supernatural in my life. I want what's supernatural to be natural to me because I'm a believer. Lord, I want to rise above my struggles and know that I've been justified 
and I know the peace of Jesus. That I've been sanctified. And I know what it means to apply the token. Lord, I, I've received the Holy Spirit. That I know you personally. And you speak to me. And I follow. And I'm led by your word. For the believers, the footsteps of the righteous are ordered by the Lord. Father, may I enter into that realm where I know that you're, I'm protected in you. I'm hid in the cleft of the rock. And I know that all things are possible. If that's your heart's desire tonight, and you just like to raise that hand, or maybe you'd like to come for prayer and say, I want to reconsecrate my life. I, I want to get back dedicated. I, I know there's a few things that aren't right. I'm going to go make them right. I'm going to move forward. And I'm going to start living what I know is right and bring my flesh under subjection. Amen. If you'd like to raise your hand, we'll pray for you. If you feel you need special prayer, Brother George would be happy to pray with you. So let's bow our head. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we've heard of the faith of our fathers and the kind of realm that they lived in, the kind of things that took place, the kind of stand they made for the word, uncompromising. Lord, their, their desire and thankfulness that they received the truth. And Lord, we've been told by promise that the hearts of the children will re be turned back to the faith that our fathers had. And we've witnessed what that faith produces. And Lord, we'd like the faith and the word that you've given us for our hour, for our day, what you've performed in our day, that our faith unwavering in that will produce the book of Acts behind our life. A book written in our day, in our time, in our circumstances. Jesus Christ being the same yesterday, today, and forever. We grant it, Father. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. God bless your brother Billy. Come lead us in a word of worship. Jesus. Lord of all, Jesus be the Lord of all. Oh, Jesus be the Lord of all. Oh, and the kingdoms of my heart. Oh, and Jesus I.
Spirit, if you could just come in this with us tonight. Amen. Don't forget Saturday and we just all come be and in fellowship that the Lord can be, can come by our way and bless us. Amen. As we heard tonight. Six o'clock Saturday, six p.m. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you're so faithful, Lord, and Lord, that you have witnesses, Lord, that the Lord say the same thing the Scripture says, and there's something in our heart that identifies, Lord, that. You're doing your will, Lord, in our lives. And we're so grateful that for tonight, Lord, we we heard your voice tonight, Lord. Lord, and there's more of you that we're hungering for, Lord. And so we pray that these words that were spoken tonight, that you've made a reality to us, Lord. We just want to say, Lord, amen to it, Lord. We want our lives to, Lord, shine light and be salty lord we just humbly ask that you would go with every heart here lord and lord help us to take to heart lord the the loss lord and just believe that your comforter will be there to take up the broken pieces lord lord we don't know what it's like to have that situation but you do lord and we're beseeching your throne lord to help brother lance and the the situation with the children, Lord. Our hearts breaking for that situation, Lord. But Lord, we know that we must carry on, Lord, and we pray that you'd give them grace, Lord, that they can continue to fight the fight of faith. And Lord, we ask your blessings upon our brother George, Lord, how we thank you, Lord, that he's just faithfully serving, Lord, in simplicity. We pray you'd go with him, Lord, strengthen him, and we pray you bless our pastor and the the services that are up and coming, Lord. May we recognize our opportunity and redeem it, Lord, because this may be our last opportunity to do a service for you, to invite a neighbor, a friend, or a loved one, Lord. We want to give our all to you, Lord, and we want, oh God, to not be ashamed and know that for surety, Lord, you'll meet the need, Lord, as we've prayed for these loved ones, and we commit, oh God, our going and coming, desiring to grow more and more like you as we commit ourselves to you and your faithful hands, we ask in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed. Amen. I'm feeling so much better talking about this good old way. Feeling so much better Oh, talking about the Lord and let's go on Let's go on talking about this good old way. Let's go on, let's go on talking about the Lord. Oh, the devil, he don't like it. Oh, talking about this good old way. Devil, he don't like it. Oh, talking about the Lord. And let's go on, let's go on talking about this good old way. Let's go on, let's go on, talking about the Lord. Oh, I'm feeling so much better, oh, talking about this good old way. Feeling so much better, oh, talking about the Lord. And let's go on, let's go on, talking about this good old way. Let's go on, let's go on, talking about the Lord. Oh, the devil 